question that was posed, should children, should babies be water baptized? And that's the question. What does the Bible say about water baptism? And let's have a whole study about that today. And, and one of the reasons, well many reasons for doing this. You know, we talk a lot here about you know, 2 Timothy 2.15 being one of those foundational uh, scriptures for the way we study the Word of God. The way we study the King James Version of the Word, uh, the Word of Truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And then why is that important? You know, at the end of the day, why is it important? Because there's one question that every one of us will answer at some point in our life, and that question is, if you died tonight, where would you go, and why would you go there? And the way you answer that matters. Because when you have to answer that question, there's no second chance. It's a pass-fail, alright? It, you know, it's either uh, right answer or wrong answer. There's no chance to go back and undo it. And the thing is, we don't know when we're going to have to answer that question because it is. I mean, we leave here today, we get to the interstate or we get to a major intersection, there's a red light, and we get hit by a car, and boom, you're now in and, and die. We're answering the question right then and there. If you died tonight, where would you go and why would you go there? And how you answer that question matters. Words do matter. All right, and, and another way I would ask you this is, in what are you trusting for your salvation? In what are you trusting for your eternity? Okay, that's, that's why the whole thing matters. And of course, we would go right to the Gospel of Christ. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is the gospel of Christ? We go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4 to see the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. How that Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, when He hung on that cross, how that Christ died, the three key words, for our sins, according to the Scriptures, was buried and raised again the third day for our justification. The gospel of Christ, the gospel of our salvation. Okay? That's it. Uh, maybe I bring in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. There's nothing we can do to gain our salvation. And because of that, there's nothing we can do to lose our salvation in the dispensation in which we live today. So I started this with the question that was posed to me by text. You know, uh, what, do the, what does the Bible say about water baptism in children? Well, we're going to address the whole thing because uh, we're going to address water baptism as a whole in today's study. And the thing is, we have over 300 and some mainstream denominations today in this country. There's over 1,500 denominations in this country if you include a lot of the one-offs. But 300 mainstreams. And that question, water baptism, gets addressed many ways. If you're asking a, a Church of Christ preacher, um, water baptism, what does the Scripture say? He says, absolutely, it's, it's required for salvation. If you ask a Baptist today, a Southern Baptist, water baptism, is it required for salvation? Or what does the scripture say about you know, water baptism? Well, no, it's not required for salvation, but it's an outward sign of an inward faith. And then you go to a, a Catholic. Well, you've got to be baptized as a baby because that washes away original sin. And you ask a Methodist, well, we baptize infants, but um, that gives them the protection. And, you know, they all have different answers. And we can say, well, I think this, and she says, I think that, and he says, well, I think this, and I say, well, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what she thinks, it doesn't matter what I think, it's what saith the Scripture. Okay, and that's where we're going with this. One other thing about the way we study, this word context. You have to take 
context into play. Alright, because if you take the text out of context, you're left with nothing but a you're left with nothing but a con. con. Alright, and that's exactly what happens all over the place. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. But there's 300 cons going on and the question is, what saith the Scripture? So again, the, the question posed that we're answering in today's um, study is, what does the Scripture say, what does the Bible say about water baptism in children? Okay, so first of all, the Old Testament, and if I went back to my timeline here, so for if you're new on the camera, we have a timeline, Genesis through Malachi being the Old Testament, then these 33 years are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, followed by Acts. I'm just going to say the next books are Romans through Philemon. And then the next books are Hebrews through Revelation. There's your Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Now, what saith the Scripture matters. Now Genesis to Malachi, I can't find a word about children and baptism. I'll just say that right now. Can't, can't find a word about it. So I'm not saying it doesn't, it says children should be baptized. I'm not saying it says they shouldn't be baptized. I'm saying I can't find anything in Genesis to Malachi about children. And for that matter, people in general. We get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's where I really want to pick this up because of the 300 and some mainstream denominations today, most, this is a Sunday morning, are following the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, if Christ said it, that's good enough for me. And let's, let's go back and, and look, at, uh, uh, look at some things. Let's actually start in the book of Luke. Actually, first go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Before we go anywhere, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. To launch us into our study here today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want to start in verse 18. Verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of of God. And as Romans 1.16 told us, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Alright? But other but but to those that are lost, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the gospel of Christ, how the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and raised again for our justification. That's foolishness to them. I mean according to what the verse just said right there, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. By the way, if you have anything other than a King James Bible, your book in front of you probably says at the end of verse 18, But unto us which are being saved, it is the power of God. Wow, how do you ever know if you're saved or not, if you're not using the King James Version of the, of the Bible? Alright, so once again, as in, you don't need to turn there, but Another verse we use many times in here, I've been using a lot lately, is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, you know, where Paul says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And how did the serpent beguile Eve? Attack the word of God. Yea, hath God said. And he went on to add just one little word here, deducted one little word there, and totally changed everything for the next 6,000 years for sure. Okay, so using 118, the preaching of the cross, that's what it is all about today. Now let's go back and let's look at the Lord Jesus Christ and His earthly ministry. Come to the book of Luke, chapter 3. One of the first questions I posed back to the gentleman that asked me the question, what, what does the Bible say about babies and baptism? Actually, it wasn't children, it was babies. You know, uh, what, does, what does the Bible say about babies and water baptism? 
And I just asked him a question back. I said, by the way, what age was the Lord Jesus Christ when he was baptized? And second question, why was he baptized? So those are the two questions that I posed back to him. You ought to think about that. Stop the tape if you're watching right now and think about those answers. What age was he and why was he baptized? Interesting. So if we go to um, Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, and let's start in verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, wow, so people are being baptized here, and by the way, uh, there's no real reference of kids and certainly not infants here. These are the people, men and women, being baptized here. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove unto him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Well, there you go, 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, and on and on is the whole lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ right there. Wow, so he's beginning his earthly ministry right here by being baptized. And yes, that's water baptized. And a second thing about that is he's 30 years of age. So all I can tell you who asked the question, the Lord Jesus Christ was not baptized as a baby. He was baptized when he was 30. Is that the first, that wasn't the first time baptism? No. no that, so the question is, is that the first time baptism is in the Bible? No. Absolutely not. Okay. What's interesting is back here though, you don't see massive baptisms. You don't see it until John the Baptist starts baptizing people clear out here, you know, in the book of Matthew. And of course, he baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, there were other people being baptized. But let's go back and let's look at some of the origins of baptism. And remember, he's 30. And by the way, I would ask this too. Did the Lord Jesus Christ ever commit sin? No. 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 2 Corinthians 5.21 for he, God, hath made him Christ, right? For he hath made him to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ never sinned or he could not take our place on that cross where our sins could be placed on him. Okay, so he never committed sin. So question, uh, to those of you that might, I'm speaking to the camera I believe as much as any time here, for those of you that might believe in that um, philosophy that infants should be baptized to wash away original sin, um, I, I guess that's why Christ wasn't baptized then. Or, but why was he baptized at 30 if it has anything to do with washing away original sin? I, I'd say maybe that's a, one good reason so far to believe it has nothing to do with washing away original sin. Now, is it a cleansing is another question. The age of 30, let's come back to the book of Numbers. So now we are going way back here in time. The book of Numbers, chapter 4. So in Numbers chapter 4, the Lord's, and the Lord's, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Take the sums of the sons of Kohath and from among the sons of Levi, after their families, by the house of their fathers. Who are the Levites? The, the priests, right? The anointed priests at that. Thank you. Okay, the Levites are the priests back here. Verse thir uh, so the middle of verse 2 again among the sons of Levi, after their families, by the house of their fathers, from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, all that enter into the host, to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Notice the age here, starting at age 30, up to age 50. Come down to verse 23. Verse 22, Take also the sum of the sons of Gershom, 
throughout the houses of their fathers by their families from 30 years old and upward unto 50 years old shalt thou number them all that enter in to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation once again we're, we got the priesthood going here and they start at age 30 verse 30 from 30 years old and upward unto 50 thou shalt number them everyone that entereth into the service to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation verse 35 from 30 years old and upward even unto 50 verse 39 from 30 years old and upward unto 50 years old, everyone that entereth into the service for the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 43, from 30 years old to 50. Verse 47, from 30 years old upward even unto 50. Does anybody have a problem understanding that the priesthood back here started at 30 and it went to 50? Okay, that's what's going on here so why was Christ 30 because to be a priest and he's called the, the he's called the chief priest right he was so right back here Matthew Mark Luke and John the Lord Jesus Christ is baptized at the age of 30 because he's going into the priesthood it's as simple as that so we can at least maybe start seeing some things about the baby part the infant part and water baptism question so when John the Baptist baptized Christ and he, I don't know the scripture or anything, but uh, stated uh, to fulfill scripture, right? Is he referring back to this? Right? This would be part of it, absolutely, and we'll probably see a little bit more um, in some more scriptures to come. So yes, that's exactly why. Actually, while we're back here, we'll do it now. I think we're going to do this later, but um, um, Leviticus, book before it. Come back to Leviticus, uh, chapter 8. Leviticus, chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him. So Aaron, chief priest back here, right? And his sons with him in all the garments and the anointing oil and a bullock for the sin offering. I'm in Leviticus 8, verse 2 and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread, and gather thou the congregation together into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He baptized them right there. So Jerry, there's your first baptism right there. Leviticus, I don't know, Leviticus chapter 8 where the priest and the priesthood is being baptized. And yes, it's water. It is a washing with water. It is baptism. Come back to your left. Exodus chapter 40. Bless you. Now I'm going to jump into a couple things here to make this a little quick here. Exodus chapter 40. Let's just, since we already read some of this, um, we're going to jump. No, it's good to get the whole. We're going to start in verse 1. Exodus chapter 40, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, on the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony and the covenant, or, or, and cover the ark with the veil. And thou shalt bring in the table and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick and the light of the lamps thereof. And thou shalt set the altar of gold for incense before the ark of the testimony and put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle. And thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and shalt put water therein. And thou shalt set up the court roundabout, and hang up the, uh, the hanging at the court gate. And thou shalt take the anointing oil, 
and anoint the tabernacle. Now you see we're talking about the tabernacle, the order of service, everything about the children of Israel back here. There was a very definitive order about this. And by the way, you see so many of the 300 and some denominations today that will pick out certain parts of this even. You know, you go to Catholic Church and you're going to see a whole lot of this stuff. Every one of those 300 denominations is absolutely scriptural in what they're doing. They're just not dispensational in doing most of those things today in the year 2016 in a period that we'll put up here in a little bit, but it's called the dispensation of the grace of God, Ephesians chapter 3. But let's stay where we are. We're in Old Testament right now. We were in verse 10. And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all his vessels and sanctify the altar. And it shall be an alt altar most ho holy. Remember, it took that oil, the anointing oil. And how many denominations today are going to run and grab anointing oil today? Okay, it's scriptural to do it, just not today in the year 2016. And thou shalt anoint the laver in his foot and sanctify it. Verse 12. Here's where we want to go now. Verse 12 is the key. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. As we read over there in Leviticus just a minute. Come ahead to verse 30. Verse 30. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water there to wash withal. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. And they went into the tent of the congregation. And when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay, so washing is baptism. It is washing of water. It is a cleansing. When people went near lepers, they had to be rebaptized every time. They had to be rewashed with waters back here in the Old Testament. Okay, it's just how it was. Okay, so Christ starts his ministry at 30. Of course, he's got a three, you know, two and a half, three year ministry. He's crucified. Of course, we know today, which they didn't know then, it was a mystery. We know today that he died for our sins was buried and raised again for our justification. That was a mystery hid in scriptures, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Otherwise they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory, we'd still be in our sins. Okay, so let's come back to the cross. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John pretty much cover this time period. Then the book of Acts picks up. So we want to go there, Acts chapter 1. Let's go right there and pick up. So we're following this through. Just the way your Bible unfolds. Steve, you're treating the book as a history book. You're treating the Bible as a history book. Um, and the problem is? It is. It's a history book. Treat it that way. Let, let it unfold in history. Okay, because that thing about context. You've got to take things in context. Okay, Acts chapter 1, let's get there. I have a quick question. Okay. How old were those kids in Exodus? Oh, and his sons, 30. Yes. Well, it doesn't say that. What, what does it say? Well, they're at least 30 because they're... Pretty... They're going into the priesthood and it said in the other scriptures that they had to be 30. That, that was what we read before that. Okay. And, and that is that same time period. Even though the books are later, Leviticus, okay. it's that same time period. So we know they're 30. And actually, some are up to 50. Between 30 and 50, those are the ones that, that are brought there. I'm sorry? What happens to the guys that are like 51 years old? You're out of that ministry and you have a different ministry, but you're not part of the priesthood. Okay? Again, I didn't write the rules. I'm just reading them. Mr. Officer, why is it 45 here? I think it should be 50, you know? It says 50. I don't care what you think. Or it says 45, whatever. I just, I just blew all that one. You know, what the written part says is the gospel in that case. Okay, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water 
but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And of course, by context, this is the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the eleven. There's not yet a new twelfth. He's talking to the eleven apostles. And then he ascends into heaven. But before he does that, in verse 6, he's, they ask him, um, when they therefore were come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay, they're looking for the kingdom. They're, they're looking for the land, as they have been looking all throughout this time period. It's all about the land. When do the children of Israel, when do the Jews inherit the land promised to them? Through Abraham, through Moses, through Isaac, through all of the fathers, as it's called, as they are called. Okay, and they're going to get that kingdom in the future, and we know that today as well. They will get that. Okay, so we just see the, the reference to water there. Now, come to Acts chapter 2. Here, we, you know, I said at the beginning about those 300 and some denominations, I picked Church of Christ and Baptist as two. Here is where two of them just go at each other big time. This is the first time that Peter preaches. We are just 50 days after the crucifixion. Acts chapter 2 is 50 days after, so we're unfolding in time here. 50 days after the crucifixion, here's what Peter says. Now first of all, so Acts chapter 2, just so you know, in verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. That's how you know it's 50 days after the cross. Now, Peter, first they speak in tongues. Are tongues for us today or not? Well, they, it's scriptural to speak in tongues. They do it right here in Acts 2. It's just not dispensational to do it in the year 2016, which is in a latter dispensation, today's dispensation. So it's scriptural to do it, not today. Then he preaches a murder indictment. That man that you crucified back there, verse, verse 36 is his conclusion. In verse 36 he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. There it is, the gospel of God. Not the gospel of Christ. That's the gospel of God right there. He is both Lord and Christ. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what Peter preached. That's the gospel, one of the gospels he preached right there. Now, Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, heart and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We realize we messed up. We crucified the Son of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 38 is that dissension between Church of Christ and Baptist, Southern Baptist today. Verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, and yes, that's water baptism, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now actually, all 300 today, we get so many different ones out of that one verse, it's amazing. So, Church of Christ, if you ask the Church of Christ doctrine, let's, let's, let me state it that way. If we had the doctrine of the Church of Christ right here on a piece of paper, it would tell you that yes, water baptism is required for salvation. If you're not water baptized, you're not saved today, based on Acts 2.38. Southern Baptists will use the same verse, and they will say, no, water baptism is an outward sign of an inward faith. First you repent of your sins, then as an outward sign you would get water baptized. That's what Acts 2.38 tells us to do. Then you would have many others. To, there's a whole other movement today that will use that same verse and say, yeah, but it's all about the last part. Because when you do those, it's the last phrase. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, how do I know if I have it? Well, have you spoken in tongues yet? No. Well, then you must not have gotten the Holy Ghost. You better come down to the altar. We're going to put oil on you and anoint you, lay hands on you. I mean, they just pull all different parts of the Bible together. Every one of those is scriptural, but they're not dispensational to do it today. Once again, it matters not what I think, what you think, it's what saith the Scripture. And the Scripture also tells us that God is not the author of confusion. So no, there are no contradictions about this. It's laying it out in time, what applies at what time period. You know, I love this time of year, it's football season. 
All right, and yesterday, <laughs> I finally get some amens from the crowd. How about that? You know, and yesterday was the kickoff for, um, for the college uh, season. Who won that? What was that score? 56 to, or 52 to 6? Who was that team? <laughs> Roll time. Okay. Got that out. Anyway, so we, we had the start of the season yesterday. And of course, right here, and this is Austin, Texas, we have a great uh, game going on today. Texas, you know, Notre Dame coming in. And I hope UT understands they don't stand a chance. I mean, Catholics coming in to play on a Sunday? Are you kidding me? There's something we said about Catholics. <laughs> okay, here's why I'm bringing this up. Context, dispensations, applying the rules that apply in the dispensation in which you live. Okay? Because dispensations change. There are many dispensations throughout your Bible. We are right here in this dispensation. It's not yet on the board. It'll be followed by this dispensation followed by that dispensation those are different those are the future ones to come there are other dispensations through the book of Acts you've got to by scripture following 2nd Timothy 2 15 figure out not by what some preacher like me tells you some what the Bible tells you I'm going to suggest to you you be like the Bereans in Acts 17 Verse 12 says, therefore many of them believed. Whenever you see therefore, ask yourself, why for did many of them believe? It's verse 11 of Acts 17. And the Bible calls the Bereans more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Actually, we're in Acts. Go there. Acts 17. See it in scriptures. Acts 17. Since we're in the book, we're going to go there. Acts 17, as you see in verse 12, it says, Therefore many of them believed. Come back to verse 11 to understand why for many of them believed. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And here's why. In that, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed. They did not believe it when they first heard Paul preach those things to them. They then, after they heard him preach in a Bible class like this, go back and search the Scriptures, receive it with readiness of mind, go back and search the Scriptures, whether those things were so. Then believe it once you see it by Scripture. Just like these Bereans, that's why Jerry Lockhart called his church Berean Bible Church. That's why Brother E.C. Moore called his church Berean Bible Church. The philosophy of the Bereans. By the way, it's not the instructor that's more noble, it's the students that are more noble in this passage. Don't let anybody try to tell you otherwise. The students are more noble in that they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Amen. Okay. And keep context in there. So back to Acts 2. Acts 2, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, I'm just going to jump ahead and say it this way. If you're going to let that verse say, you know, that, what that verse says is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So it is, repent and be water baptized for the remission of sins. That's what it says to the people in that dispensation, of course. It does not say, repent for the remission of sins and be baptized as an outward sign of an inward faith. You can't find that anywhere in scriptures. Water baptism is part of the salvation program in this dispensation when this is written. But I meant to say at the beginning of this, if you're not going to watch the whole 45 minutes, don't watch this tape at all. Um, hopefully somebody's locked the door and people in here have to listen to the whole thing. You can't leave early. But you're taking, that's why I had context up here. You're going to hear it out of context if you don't listen to the whole study here. All right, so back to Peter. Yes, water baptism's part of this. Uh, go ahead, chapter 2, chapter 2, uh, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Wow, 3,000 people believed that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
He is both Lord and Christ. What shall we do? Repent. Not repent of your sins. It's repent, change your mind of who that man was back there 50 days ago. They did, and then they got water baptized, all 3,000 of them. Yes, water baptism was part of the program here, as was the next verse or two. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread and prayers. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. All that believed were together and had all things common. Don't miss that. What does that mean? The next verse, 45. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them all men as every man had need. Wow. People kind of miss that part today too. You're taking it out of context if you don't do every part of that. If you think any part of that is for the year 2016. And I'm going to at least put 2016 up here. It's somewhere in that period not on the board. I'll put it in parentheses as a matter of fact. I'm going to suggest to you that Peter, right here, 50 days after the cross, thought he was in this period. Why do you say that? Acts chapter 2, back up. First thing he says. Peter starts, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, said unto them, I'm coming now, verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. And he goes on to quote Joel chapter 2, verses 27 to 32. It's this period right here. It's called the 70th week of Daniel. It's called the period of great tribulation. Isaiah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. Joel, Hosea. Most of the Old Testament prophets are prophesying this. Then the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth to set up his thousand year kingdom. Any, anybody dispute that? I mean, all the Old Testament prophets talk about that, and I'm sure you on the film will agree with that. Peter thought he was right there. That's why they're selling out having all things common, because what else happens during this time period? Oh yeah, that guy called the Antichrist will come to earth, right in the middle of that seven year period of great tribulation. Anybody that takes the mark of the beast, they're done. They lose their salvation, they cannot ever be saved again. Hebrews tells you that in chapter 6, chapter 10. First Peter tell, or Second Peter tells you that. They lose their salvation. They cannot get it back. I thought you said eternal security is in the Bible. I thought you said we have eternal security. We absolutely do in the dispensation of the grace of God as laid out in Ephesians chapter 3, dispensation of grace. But that's the only place in your Bible where we have eternal security. Back here, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's in red, red uh, letters. You know, you can blaspheme God, you can blaspheme me, the Son, but he that blasphemes the Holy Spirit, it shall be forgiven him, neither in this world, nor in the world to come. That's the unpardonable sin. Is there an unpardonable sin? Yes, there is. That's it. It's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Today, we have eternal security. Because Christ died for all our sins, Colossians 2.13. Alright, we're talking about water baptism. Okay. So yes, the people that believe Peter got water baptized. Now, we know in Acts... I'm going to use blue here. We know in Acts chapter 9 is, is when that guy Saul gets saved. That's the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to a guy named Saul. That's Acts chapter 9. That's approximately one year after the cross. But look at some other things before that period happens. Talking about water baptism. Come to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. So Philip is one of the seven, I'm going to call them junior apostles, that were named at the beginning of chapter 6. So Philip's one of those seven. Now verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority. You know what, I'm going to skip a lot of this right now and get to the punchline. So, so this eunuch is reading out of Isaiah. And um, so come to verse 30, the end. 
Philip says to him, he says, Understandest thou what thou readest? Verse 31, and he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So they talk, and then Peter, or Philip, explains this passage in Isaiah to the eunuch. Uh, verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, preached unto him, Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. Okay, pretty tough to miss that this is water baptism we're going to talk about. Verse 36. And there came a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I just blew it. If you're watching this tape and you're reading anything other than the King James Bible, you can go ahead and say it. Now, what does your verse say there? And look real close. You're going to see if you have anything other than the King James Bible, you have a verse 36 and you have a verse 38. They know they're leaving out verse 37. I'm sorry, verse 36. That's where I missed it. Wait. Verse 37. You go right from 36 to 38. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? In the text that you're reading, in, in this text that I'm reading is not a King James Version. It said, now as they went down the road, it came to some water. Okay. It said, it came to some water, and, uh, and the eunuch said, see here is the water. What hinders me from being baptized? Okay, and verse 37 is the one they leave out then, right? Verse 37, it says, it said, then Philip said, if you, believe, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, what does verse 38 say? So he commanded, so he commanded the charity to stop. So he commanded the charity to stand still. And both Philip and the Enoch went down into the waters and he baptized them. Okay, and what version are you do you have, if I may ask? When, when, when you were reading the 36, I didn't see... Uh, when you were reading the 36, I didn't, see, I didn't hear you say some water. So I thought, oh. I thought they added a word here. Oh. So I was trying to figure out did they actually oh, add no. a word. But, I, but I'm reading from, uh, um, from the Gideon. That's King James. That's King James. Yeah. Some of well, so not anymore. Yeah, yeah are, they used to be. Um, how about at the front? I'd be curious what, what uh, version. It might be New King James. It, it's, a good, it's a good chance it could be New King James. But if you were to look at NIV, if you were to look at ASV, you know, any, any version based on the 1881 version like RSV, ASV, NIV, NASB, they're going to leave out that verse, verse 37. Kind of amazing why they would do that. Now, New King James does have it. They probably got a footnote that says, you know, many manuscripts leave this out and blah, 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 you know, about that. Um, kind of interesting. Why in the world would you leave out the, where the eunuch says, um, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, especially the word the there, by the way, does yours say that I believe He is the Son of God? Verse 37. He says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Son of God? Yeah. yeah. Great. Amen to that. Um, again, NIV, ASV, NASB, I'll leave that out. Amazing why they would leave that out. Um, so, the point is, Acts chapter 8, it's still water baptism. It's still part of the program. So we're up to here, Acts chapter 8. Wow. So Acts chapter 9, this guy Saul is saved. The appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ unto Saul. And by the way, yes, he is water baptized. Alright, it, it wouldn't be, you know, so... 
So Acts chapter 9, verse 19. I'm sorry, verse 18. Verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, now again, this was all Jews back here. There's no reason to believe they would have done anything differently. That's what they were taught to do. They would have water baptized Paul at this point. So up to Acts 9, still have water baptism, part of the program. Now, why are they doing this? Remember, Peter thinks he's walking into this, right? Hebrews chapter 8. Actually, before go to Hebrews Grab that in one hand and go to 1 Peter in the other hand. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. You know what, we're going to skip Hebrews for now. Just go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 3. Starting in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 21. Whatever this is we're about to read saves people. According to Peter, verse 21, he says... The light figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Just like Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Water baptism is part of salvation in the dispensation when Peter is teaching this and preaching this. In the dispensations where this doctrine applies. That being the key. So Peter says in verse 21, the like figure doth also save us. Well, what is the like figure? Let's go back to verse 20. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by what? Water. Next verse, the like figure has to be water. It's not the ark. The like figure, where even, even, even baptism doth also now save us. Water baptism saves these people to whom Peter is writing. The key is you're not one of those people. Who are those people? Back up a, a chapter, chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and remember everything we read back there in Leviticus and Exodus, the priest and the priesthood back there, and water baptism being a big part of what was required of those priests. Alright? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. Verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. On and on he goes. Peter's building a royal priesthood. Make no mistake about it. That's what's going on here. It's the new covenant where we were going to read in Hebrews chapter 8. Actually, we'll, we will still go there. Hebrews chapter 8. Because again, it's what the Scripture saith that matters. Hebrews chapter 8. By the way, you'll notice how we broke down the groups up here. Romans to Philemon just happened to be the 13 books written by the Apostle Paul. 17 times in here, he tells us he's the Apostle to the Gentiles. Hebrews through Revelation, I'm going to suggest to you, is the doctrine for this seven year and thousand year period. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 8, verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much, how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. All these betters. For if that first covenant, the old covenant, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, the new covenant. 
For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Now watch who he's making it with. Right here, it's, it's, it's in the verse. When I will make, verse 8, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Are you part of the house of Israel, part of the house of Judah? No, we're the church which is the body of Christ. Verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make. So it's got to be in the future from this time period. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. After what days? It's the same days that Peter thought he was walking into. Those days. Those seven years right there. After those days, he's going to do something. We're going to read what he's going to do in just a minute. But it's after these days. That's why Peter and the twelve, they're selling out. They're speaking in tongues. They're healing. We haven't even talked about healing in the role of priest yet. Which we won't. If you were to go back to Leviticus chapter 20 and, and search it out, it would tell you why healings are in the Bible. It's all for priests because no person, priest or otherwise, can enter into the temple. We did this last week actually. But Acts chapter 3, 4, and 5, we see a story there about the lame man for, that's 40 years of age. Since birth, he was lame, the Bible tells us in those three chapters of Acts 3, 4, and 5. He's not allowed in the temple. But they always lay him at the steps of the temple. That's why when Peter and John come and heal that man, they can bring that man into the temple because he no longer has the blemish. As Leviticus chapter 20 says, that man would, um, what's the word he would do to the, he would, um, duh, defile the temple. I wanted to get the biblical word. He would defile the temple if he were to walk into it. Okay, he was not allowed in the temple until he was healed. Then he could. That's why there's healings in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's why there were healings back there. That's why there were tongues so they could go to different areas. That's, that's why all these things. That's why there were water baptisms because of the royal priesthood that Peter is building in Acts 2 through 8 in his earthly ministry. That's what's going on. Acts, uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Now we're coming back to chapter, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Now watch what he's going to do after those days. And he comes again. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to my, me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor. And every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Wow. That's, how can people think Hebrews applies to us today? Everybody out there today knows the Lord? Are you kidding me? Somebody forgot to tell a whole group of people that's coming out of the Mideast, taking over Europe, trying to come over and take over this country right now. Over there, they're... They're slaying people. They're crucifying them upside down now. They're slitting their throats. They know the Lord? Wow. Why are you even here today if you believe that is to you? Why are you even watching the tape? Verse uh, 10 says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least, least to the greatest. No, he tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God. We are to study today. Hebrews says, don't teach every man his neighbor because the law is going to be in their heart. It's because Hebrews is out. This, what we're talking about here in the New Covenant is out here in the future. It's not today. That's how people get these confused and, you know, this whole question, water baptism. Now, in the name of time, let's jump ahead to baptism today. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. 
There's a whole lot more we could have done back there, bless you. So through the Bible we have priests, they absolutely have to be baptized. Then we have Christ starting and now we see the masses of people being baptized. By the way, you don't even see that back here prior to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And we see Christ at the age of 30 become a priest. Just as Old Testament scriptures, right back there the first books written, were telling us. And that's going on. Now in Acts 9 this guy Saul gets saved. And so begins some new dispensations. The first one's a dispensation of the Gospel of Christ. The second one that begins at the end of Acts, Acts 28, is the dispensation of the grace of God in Ephesians 3. We're in Ephesians 5. The question is about water baptism. And here's why it's a, a critical question, really. Because in, in Ephesians chapter five, uh, 4, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. And boy, oh boy, like I say, if there's anything that disunifies, as in splits families and splits churches today, it's the issue of water baptism. Are we doing it the right way? Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even, use, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, three baptisms. One God and Father of all... No, it's not what it says, does it? It says one baptism. Now, we haven't by Scripture yet determined which baptism. What we do know, without a shadow of a doubt, is in the dispensation of the... If you even look in my book, it's on the same page even. Chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. That was the beginning of chapter 3. Chapter 4 says there's one baptism. There's one of all these seven different things. But included in there is one baptism. Is that what your Bible says? Even the other version back there, I bet, says one baptism. Amen? Great. Our question is, which baptism? Come to John chapter 3. Just to establish, in your Bible there are many baptisms. If you remember Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ told the eleven, John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, right? Uh, where I said to tell you, ask you to go? Huh? John 3. John 3. Actually, come, actually, let's do this in Matthew instead. Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. I want you to see three baptisms in one verse. I thought you said there's no contradictions in the Bible, Steve. There are not any contradictions. There's just different dispensations. There's different rules. I never concluded the football. Verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. There's one baptism. It's water baptism. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. There's a second one. And with fire. There's a third one. Well, there's three baptisms in one verse. I don't even know if one of those three are the one that we're talking yet by Scripture. If, if that's the one we're talking about in Ephesians chapter 4. But there's three right there in, Ma in Matthew chapter 3. So yes, there's many baptisms in the Bible. Just like there's many Gospels in the Bible. Alright, now, our question is, Ephesians 4 says, in the dispensation of the grace of God, in which the year 2016 definitely is part of that, dis that time period, which is the one baptism? Is it water? Is it holy, baptized with the Holy Ghost? Or is it with fire? We need to figure this out, right? Now, let me go, as you go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I want to go back to my analogy of football. Because different dispensations have different rules, you've got to play by the rules. Last, yes, last night we were watching many different games yesterday. Now, in college, 
a good reception, one that is you can receive a ball and it is a correct way to receive the ball with one foot in bounds. Standing here with one foot for the longest time. You only need one foot in bounds. Get possession of the ball and that's a good reception. The ref's going to come over and he's going to go, yep, receive, that one counts. The ball's right here, here we go. Now, next year that guy gets drafted in the first round because he's the best receiver in the country. Maybe his name was Julio Jones or somebody like that. And he comes to the pros. And the first game of pros, he's out there and he catches the same way. Great reception, one foot in bounds. The second foot goes out and the official goes, no, incomplete. And he goes, what do you mean? Last year that was a great reception. He says, yeah, but that was different rules for a different dispensation. You were in the dispensation of college football. Welcome to the pros. All right, same thing here. All right, I'm making an analogy. There is a dispensation prior to this. Now you're in the dispensation of the grace of God. You've got to answer the question, if you died tonight, where would you go and why would you go there? By the rules that apply to the dispensation of the grace of God. Because it was different prior to this and it will be different after this. You need the rules for here. That's why we're doing all of this. Which, which one is it? Which one is it? You've got Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in one hand. Keep it there. Also get Romans chapter 6. They go together. Now, Romans chapter 6, once again, Church of Christ is going to go here and say, see, you better get water baptized or you're not saved. Baptism is part of salvation here. And I say, yes, baptism is part of salvation. The question is, which baptism? Because we already saw three in Matthew chapter 3. Romans chapter 6 verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live, in, uh, live any longer therein? Watch this now. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death. And I say amen to that. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Okay, so you see here in verse 4, therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. Absolutely. We are buried with Him. We are resurrected with Him as well. Now, baptism did that. And that's where Church of Christ will take a, a, um, a Baptist right there to that passage and he's got him. Baptism is what puts you into Christ's death. Amen! Which baptism? And remember, Ephesians 4 says there's one baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 13. Verse 12, I'm going to start in. For as, by, for as the body is one, here's the ones again, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. Verse 13, it does not say, for with water are we all baptized into one body. It does not say, for by fire are we all baptized into one body. It does not say, for with the spirit are we all baptized into one body body it says for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body Ephesians chapter 4 written by the same guy that wrote this is spiritual baptism it happens at the moment you go to Ephesians chapter 1 
Ephesians chapter 1, it goes at, from the, at the moment that you go from believing the words of the gospel of Christ to trusting in the words of the gospel of Christ for your salvation. You get saved. Ephesians 1.13, or the end of verse 12, who first trusted in Christ. That's the subject here. Ephesians 1 verse 12, now verse 13. So, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. And put yourself in there. At some point, there's a time where you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Yes, you're baptized by the Spirit. You're sealed right then and there. Nothing you can do to gain it. Nothing you can do to lose it. Praise the Lord for that. Now, before we leave the subject of water baptism. So Ephesians 4, there's one baptism. There's one gospel, there's one faith, there's one Lord, there's one baptism. One body of Christ. Okay, that one baptism is 1 Corinthians 12. It's being baptized by the Spirit. Okay, so that's our baptism today. By Scripture. Now one other thing. The same guy that wrote 1 Corinthians 12 wrote 1 Corinthians 15, which is the Gospel of Christ. He also wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Go there. We started... So he's the guy that wrote the doctrine for the church which is the body of Christ. Peter and the Twelve started a church in Acts 2. It's called the Kingdom Church. It's the same church, it's the same gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching. It's the gospel of the Kingdom. Repent, for the Kingdom of Heaven is at hand. He that shall endure to the end, the same that shall be saved. That's what Peter's preaching back here. Then he says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Verse, uh, Acts 3.19 uh, repent that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth. Set up His kingdom. Now, where we started 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now why are we going back there? Because we're going to talk about water baptism one more time. The same guy, Paul, that, pre that wrote, th that's 13 books. By the way, if you have a King James Version, would you, would you turn to Romans 1, uh, keep, of course, keep there, but Romans 1, 15. For I, um, for I am ready to preach, what does it say? Or no, not that, Romans 1, 16. Uh, for I am not ashamed of what? The gospel of Christ. It does say gospel of Christ. You've got new King James. Um, okay, I've got the NIV pulled up and it doesn't say of Christ. Bingo. Thank you. If you have a King James, in Romans to Philemon, so the term gospel of Christ, that is the, gospel, the power of God unto salvation, right? You'll see it 11 times if you do a word search. In Romans to Philemon. You'll see it zero times before the book of Romans. You'll see it zero times in your Bible. It doesn't matter what version you have, by the way. But in the King James, you'll see it 11 times. And as we just heard, in case you couldn't hear it on the tape, someone here has an NIV. And I would say to you, NASB, ASV. All other perversions of the Word of God have it 10 times. The first time it shows up in your Bible is, in your King James Bible, is Romans 1.16, where he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So many people want it to be the same gospel throughout. Most of those 300 denominations today want the Bible to be the same gospel. They'll tell you that. It's the same gospel. No. No. If, if you're on our website... Go to this, the book of Romans study. You'll see the second, the second study. Uh, the second study there says 12 Gospels or 11 Gospels, I forget. But we show you 11 different Gospels just in the New Testament. Okay, the point is, Paul wrote Romans to Philemon. That's the doctrine for the church which is the body of Christ. After this dispensation is over and it ends with what is the church is typically called the rapture of the church, the calling out of the body of Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
verses 13 to 18 and think, praise God, that is absolutely when the rapture happens is at the end of this dispensation. So begins the trib. By 2 Thessalonians you know that, that the trib comes after this. That period you don't want to be part of. Alright, now anyway, let, let's come back to what we're doing here. How are we saved today in the year 2016? It's the Gospel of Christ. How that Christ died, three key words, for our sins. Was buried, raised again for our justification. You just trust in that. You believe that those things happen. Trust in that and that alone. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, water baptism is not part of any of that, Church of Christ people. Alright? It's not part of it. Okay? It's just believing that and that alone for yourself. Either there's nothing, either that was good enough for me, or I'll just die and go to hell anyway, because there's nothing I can do to be good enough. Not one of us worth the gunpowder to take to blow us into hell. Okay, wrapping up. Verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 1. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Uh, let's just back up to verse 14. I thank God. Wow, it's ever coming here. Paul thanks God about this. For, let's keep reading. I thank God that I baptize none of you. Wait a minute. If water baptism has anything to do either with your salvation or as an outward sign of an inward faith, whatever you want to make it, why in the world would the Apostle Paul say, I thank God I baptized none of you? There must be some reason. Now, so we don't take it out of context, it's finished. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. By the way, those are the Jewish leaders of the Jewish church back in Acts chapter 18. That's why he baptized, and yes, that is water baptism of those two. Verse 15, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Don't miss it. The guy that wrote half the New Testament, 13 out of 27 books that are the New Testament in your Bible, says, I thank God I baptized none of you, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. How do you get around that? Then out here after Acts 28, he wrote Ephesians. Told us about the dispensation of the grace of God. Told us in Ephesians 4 that there is one baptism. Clearly it's not water baptism. Clearly it's not being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Clearly it's not being baptized with fire. It is being 1 Corinthians 12, being baptized by the Spirit. That's your baptism that is part of your salvation that does put you in, identify you with Christ into His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Okay? Thank you. That is how the Scripture would answer what does the Scripture say about children, about infants, and water baptism, as well as all water baptism? Questions, comments, or otherwise? Great timing. Thank you. Questions, comments, or otherwise? Yes, sir. I would say the only Bible to study from is the King James Version. And, and we do do... Um, it, so our website is butnow.info and on the right side we have subjects. And there's two or three there about the King James Version and the authenticity of it and, and why. Um, and, and I would encourage you, that's a great study, is to study that out. Your, I don't mean that one going there to watch it, but to study out on your own the whole subject of which version. I fought that one hard, I can tell you that. Amen. I fought it real hard. Sure. That's heaven, by the way. 